futurebased.org. I think that uh, organisms and other biological individuals are waves. So we are waves propagating through matter. Welcome to the podcast series Creating Life for Future Based. I am Myelin Pineapples, multidisciplinary researcher and creator. In these podcasts, you will listen in on my interviews with scientists and artists about topics as diverse as human birth, plant fungal interactions, and the pan microbiome. These interviews are open ended exploratory dialogues and part of my research effort to figure out what it means to create life and be alive and what defines a human being in all that. This is Marjolein Pineapples for the Creating Life podcast series for Future Based. Today I'm talking to Dan Malter. Dan is a naturalist, mushroom enthusiast and lecturer of philosophy at the University of Tennessee, Knoxville. His research centers on questions of biological individuality, especially as it arises via symbiosis. He has recently published articles on biological individuality in mushrooms and symbiotic collectives composed of mushrooms and plants. So thank you, Dan, for joining us today. I'd like to start by diving deep into one of your research questions on biological individuality, because when we look at nature, we often mistake what is an individual. Like we see a coral, but a coral is actually multiple colony forming organisms. Or we look at a strawberry plant, like a bunch of plants, and they turn out to be part of the same individual. And you looked at biological individuality in mushrooms. And I'm really interested to see what we can learn from mushrooms about what it means to be an individual. Okay, thank you for that question. And thank you for inviting me to talk to you today. It's an honor to be here. I want to start by saying that individuality manifests itself in different ways in nature. So for example, you said that we can look at them, we can see individuals, and we can. This is called phenomenal individuation. And that works for some things. For counting buffalo, for example, we can just count the heads, one, two, three. That's not going to help us for lots of other cases, for example, a mushroom. So I want to talk about, first of all, we can have different biological theories, which we can use to, to find out where the individuals are. So for example, if we want to use immunological theory, we can look at the human organism and we can say, this one human organism is composed of multiple evolutionary lineages. You're going to have the Homo sapien lineage together with thousands of microbial lineages. And the immune system is integrating all that stuff together into a single cohesive whole. Yeah. So um, actually, are we like one person or are we like millions of individuals? That's sort of the question there. I think the answer is both. I think the answer is both. And in order to flesh that out, we need to apply other theories. And so, so the, the theory I want to talk about today is evolutionary theory. It is absolutely the most important theory in biology. And um, if we use evolutionary theory, we can divide single lineages into what are called Darwinian individuals. So Darwinian individuals are reproducers. They are things which reproduce. And so, as I said, we can separate a lineage into individuals by looking at the reproduction events. Uh, reproduction events, they're going to be characterized by a bottleneck. So we've got a really big organism. It goes down to a single cell, and a lot of times a single cell, and then it balloons back out to another big organism. And so we can divide that lineage and individuals that way. Okay, as I said, when it comes to finding the Darwinian individuals and in large animals like ourselves, it's really easy. We can just see them. But when it comes to things like, like mushrooms, it gets way more complex. In order for me to, uh, to explain this complexity, I'm going to walk us through very quickly uh, yeah. the life cycle of a mushroom. A mushroom starts its life when a haploid spore goes flying through the air and lands on a suitable substrate. So let's say, for example, a rotten log. So this spore is haploid. That means it has one half of the uh, chromosomes, which are going to be in the full-blown organism. The haploid spore lands on the substrate and it germinates into a type of cell called a hypha. A hypha is similar to a cell in an animal or a plant, but it differs in that cytoplasm flows in and out of it. So there's going to be openings at either end of the hypha. And so cytoplasm can flow through the entire what's called a mycelium. A mycelium is, a, is an organism, if you will, composed of all these hyphae. And the hypha there are sort of like long stringy things, right? Growing under the ground. That's right. A hypha is going to be a long stringy thing uh, <laughs> under the ground composed of cells with little holes in them that lets fluid thro flow throughout the entire thing. Okay, we said that uh, the mama spore lands and starts making this hypha. Okay, so now daddy mushroom comes in, a spore lands on the same log, and it starts growing out this uh, very similar mycelium. Now, those two mycelia, they start growing, and when they grow together, the cell walls break down, the cytoplasm flows together into a new hypha, which now contains one nucleus from mom and one nucleus from dad. This is very similar to uh, when we have fertilization happening in plants and animals. 
but it differs from fertilization in that the two nuclei do not immediately fuse. So in plants and animals, when the cells are fertilized, the nuclei immediately fuse into a diploid nucleus. This doesn't happen with mushrooms. So what we end up with is we end up with a, a mycelium, which is composed of hyphae, each containing two nuclei, okay. one from mom and one from dad. So they are in the same sort of cell, they're in the same cell, in the same sort of bath, in the same cytoplasm, but they, the nuclei remain separate. They don't that's fuse. Right. Yeah. They, they do not fuse. Eventually those uh, nuclei will fuse, but that's only after the mycelium makes mushrooms. The mushrooms are going to be the fruiting bodies of this large underground, or in our example, inside this rotten log mycelium. So we've got the mushrooms. And now right before those mushrooms makes, make the next round of spores, those two nuclei, they will fuse and we'll have a very short period of life where they're, it's diploid, just like, just like you and I are diploid. Yeah. And then that cell makes new spores and the whole thing starts over again. Yeah. So in that sort of analogy is that like we are sort of compared as diploid organisms to the mushroom. And then underground, there's a whole lot of things going on with spores growing out to sort of complex individuals, whereas our own, you know, eggs and sperm remain single-celled, short-lived <laughs> creatures, if you could call them that. Yes, that's right. So when we're looking at the life cycle of a human, we have very short haploid stages. It's just going to be the gametes. And then we have this really long diploid stage, whereas the mushroom, it has this long haploid stage. It's got this long dikaryotic stage. Dikaryotic just means two nuclei stage. And then a very short diploid stage right before it reproduces new spores. Yeah. Before you were you were talking about Darwinian individuals, and we're we're sort of exploring here what it means to be an individual, and when you know where does one individual begin and the other one end, or where does one generation stop and where does a new generation begin? And looking at these mushrooms, I'm curious to hear what you were saying about how you can pinpoint. Okay, good question. The answer is it's complicated. So, <laughs> like uh, everything complicated. in biology always is. <laughs> yeah. This is more complicated than plant and animal biology. And the reason being is we have Darwinian individuality happening at multiple levels simultaneously. I'm going to talk about just two of them. One is uh, we have a mycelium. That's an organism. It's got multiple parental inputs. And then when that mycelium makes mushrooms and new spores go off, we can say that that mycelium has reduced. So we've got a reproducer. Therefore, we have a Darwinian individual at the level of the mycelium. But it gets complicated because these dikaryotic mycelia often have more than two parents. So I told a story about how we had mama spore and then daddy spore, and we made a dikaryotic mycelium, which then goes on to reproduce. But oftentimes, we'll have player three enter the game. Another spore will come in. That spore will make its own monokaryotic mycelium. And that monokaryotic mycelium will fuse with our dikaryotic mycelium. It will displace one of the other nuclei. And what we end up with is we end up with a single individual, the mycelium. Now it has three parents. And then player four can enter the game and player five and player six. And we can end up with this single uh, physiological integrated individual, which now has the genetics from numerous parents. And this is the cool part about it. What this results in, it results in Darwinian individuality manifesting itself at the level of the nucleus. Because once all we have all those nuclei together inside that mycelium, they are competing with one another in various ways to make it up into that mushroom so yeah. that they can make the next round of sport. So you're actually saying in this, in this way of looking at things, the nuclei are actually the individuals or Darwinian individuals. Those are the ones, like you said, they're competing for food or to get, you know, into the, be part of the next generation. And that's the level of individuality we should look at. Absolutely. So it, it happens at the level of the nucleus and at the level of the mycelium. So what I find interesting about this way of thinking, of course, we're talking about mushrooms and they have totally different life cycles from, you know, plants or humans. But still, I can't help but wonder when you look at these kinds of life cycles, what does it mean for humans and what does it mean also for, for our identity? And you, you talked at the beginning about the microbiome, about how we are simultaneously in, in, in one individual, but also sort of what I would call an ecosystem with different microbic ecosystems on our, in our bodies. How can we understand what it feels like to be ourselves? Like we have a constant identity of, you know, I'm my line. I've been my line for all my life. And I feel like me and eh, whether I'm eight or now uh, 39. And, but still like all my cells are replaced 
over the course of my lifetime, but I still feel like the same individual. And in the case of the mushroom, it's sort of the opposite. It sort of creates a new individual with sort of the same cells. I'm not sure if I'm making sense, but I'm trying to sort of boggle these concepts around and see what it means for, not just for, you know, like an abstract concept of individuality, but also for, you know, what constitutes an individual or what what is a person? Okay. Wow. That's a, that's a big question. I'm going to come back to the question of personal identity at the end, but I, I want to first introduce the concept of gen identity. I'm talking going back to Aristotle. Mm -hmm. The old view is that identity consisted in continuity of form. And so, so what does it mean to be, to be Dan Moulter from time T1 to T2? I've got the form of Dan Moulter. I'm, you, you can look at pictures of me and say, oh yeah, that's the same guy, right? Yeah. It's, it's but we know that form changes over time. This is a no brainer. We can look at a, a baby and we see that looks way different than a middle-aged person, right? We can look at things which undergo metamorphosis, right? Yeah, so, like so, butterflies or, or metamorphizing insects. Yeah. So we have... Form is changing over time, and yet our intuition is that biological individuality continues despite this metamorphosis from, from a grub into a, an adult. So formal continuity is not going to get us identity. Another view which has been proposed way back in the day, and that's what's the matter. So we have this common form of human, and you're human over there composed of this quantity of matter. I'm human over here composed of this quantity of matter, and so we can use matter to individuate. Um, the individual. Now, the problem which runs into that is we are constantly exchanging matter. So if, if we say that material composition is what makes individuality, then with every breath and every meal, we become a new individual. Setting those aside, I propose gen identity as the criterion of individuality. So a gen identical is a series of spatiotemporally continuous causes and effects, such that event one causes event two, event two causes event three, and so on. So um, an example I use in that paper is a wave. We've got a wave propagating down the beach. This stage of the wave causes the next stage of the wave. And there is material overlap. This is why I'm going to come back to the materially continuous part. So each stage of that wave shares some water molecules with the next stage of the wave. But we don't necessarily have to have shared matter at distal stages of the wave. So the wave at this point may not share any matter with the wave, which is 100 yards down the beach. And yet we say it's still the same individual. And why is that? Because we have this continuity of causality. Okay, so biological individuals, I argue, are like that wave. Every stage of a biological individual causes the next stage of the biological individual. Like the wave, we have new matter coming in, we have matter flowing out, but yet we have this continuity of identity because we have this continuous causal process. This is so fascinating because this frames being any type of organism as a process as well as, as something that's constant. Good. Yeah, I absolutely agree. As I was saying, I think that uh, organisms and other biological individuals are waves. So we are waves propagating through matter. The matter is the air we take in, the food we take in, and all that matter is there and we are propagating through it just as the wave propagates down a beach. Now, one thing you brought up, which I think is fascinating, and, and we are right on the leading edge of, of scientific metaphysics right here. You said, well, that makes biological individuals processes. And indeed it does. We are processes. And in fact, there is a, a primary school thought right now says that we are just processes. We are not substance. This is a John Dupre's school of process ontology. Now I have recently argued that organisms are both substances and processes. So we can say very much like wave particle duality, there is a thing there. And that thing is also a process. What does this mean? Because I'm curious if you could venture into like, what does this mean for, for us? Does it mean anything for our experience of ourselves or is it something, you know, just theoretical scientific or does it have real sort of implications on our sense of self? Okay. This is a great question. I, I said I was going to come back to the, the question of personal identity. And so now I will. One of the primary views on personal identity is completely consistent with my view of biological individuality. And that is called the, the memory theory and the memory links theory of personal identity. So according to the memory theory of personal identity, person is the same person at time T1 and time T2, provided that they have the same memories. Okay, so, so we can say that's what makes us a person. It's not just this bodily continuity. It's not just this continuity of causality. It's memories, right? Now, of course, the memory theory runs into problems because people tend to forget things. We tend to forget things, and we don't want to say that we are a different person every time we gain a new memory or forget something. So we get the memory links theory. Memory links theory says that the person at time T1 is the same person at time T2, provided that there are some memories which are there. So just like we said that a wave is the same wave, provided that there's this causal uh, connection and there is some overlap in approximate stages, we can say the same thing about memory. So as long as there's this, this continuity of memory, even if we lose some memories, 
as long as there's this causal series of memories, now we have a single a single person. So what we're also trying to you know figure out in this uh, creating life series is trying to make sense of a way to look at the world, look at how life is created on this planet, how it's sustained. And we've heard some very interesting things about you know the life cycle of mushrooms and about how we can use gen identity to sort of you know track individuals th throughout time, even if they change a lot or even if they lose you know parts of their memories. What I find very interesting about looking at mushrooms, looking at fungi and, you know, the mycorrhiza and mycelium is that the mycorrhiza, they build really strong sort of connections, not just, you know, we've talked about mushrooms and how they reproduce, but they also connect very intimately with plants. You know, every tree, every strawberry plant we see is intimately connected with fungi and they're sort of part of a network. What does these network connections mean for you know the entities involved? That is a great question, something which is dear to my heart. This is one of the questions which led me into biological individuality, into researching this question in the first place. I, you know, I'm a mushroom hunter. I've published 8,000 uh, photographs of mushrooms. Ask this question, it seems like there's one thing there, right? When, when, I, when I look at a patch of chanterelles in the oak tree, it seems like there's one thing there. I would describe the mycelium. Certain mycelia, they attach themselves to the roots of plants, and this is how they make their living. So the mycelium is going to break down rocks and feed minerals to the plant. And then the plant feeds it sugar in return. And so we have this nice symbiotic relationship. Now it gets complex because these underground mycelia connected to plants, they connect to more than one plant at one time. And we know that... Of course they are the promiscuous <laughs> little things. The promiscuous, <laughs> right? So, so not only will they connect parent and offspring plants, we'll have mama trees and baby trees connected and the mama tree is feeding the baby tree through this uh, this connecting mycelium. They connect whole forests. They connect different species. And so what, what science is showing lately is that we will have these very complex energy flows going between different parts of the forest at different times of the year. This has evolved and it helps the entire forest adapt to its environment. Okay, I, I want to jump back and talk about Darwinian individuality here for a moment because I have recently argued that the mushroom and the tree together, in fact, constitute one Darwinian individual. Oh, really? So, yes. I want to talk about why that is the case. So well, we had said earlier that Darwinian individuality is a matter of reproduction. So as long as we have re reproduction, we can divide that lineage into individuals. And it turns out that we have something very much like collective reproduction happening. Oftentimes, those chanterelles will make their spores. They'll go flying out to the wind and they'll end up a long ways away from, from where the oak tree is. Lots of times a, a squirrel will pick up an acorn and carry it a long ways away. So we do have reproduction happening independently at the level of the tree and at the level of the mushroom. So we have each is its own Darwinian individual. But sometimes, and in fact, frequently, that acorn will fall right at the base of the oak tree. And when it sprouts, it connects into that same chanterelle mycelium, which is already attached to the mom tree. What we have there is we have a case of collective reproduction. So that means that even though not every single time when a little oak sapling is, you know, is growing near the tree it, and it has access to the same mycelium as the parent tree and, and connected through that, even though it doesn't happen all the time, but because it happens some of the time, like with your gen identity model, where you say, as long as there's a part that sort of reproduces that way, you can look at it as uh, the same individual? Or is it like a different generation from the same individual? Well, it's, it's going to be a new generation, right? Okay, so yeah. um, we do have gen identity. So when we have collective reproduction with the plant and the mushroom together, there is a single gen identical there. There's a single causal process that's propagating through time. And then when we have that reproductive event, we've got that single composite lineage is now divided into new individuals by that reproductive event. Yeah, yeah, exactly. What strikes me is that the more we study biological life cycles, which we previously thought were pretty straightforward, but if you dive deep into them, they're actually pretty complex. And not just the life cycles, but the whole ecosystem of the forest that's, like you said, managed by mycorrhiza networks that sort of bring energy and nutrients, you know, to different parts of the forest. I mean, could you even look at the whole ecosystem as sort of a Darwinian individual, or is that like step too far? That's a fantastic question. And the, the answer is that, that, that myself and other philosophers of, bi philosophers of biology have not yet given a good account of this. So it seems like, yes, I want to say that the, the entire forest is a Darwinian individual. I think that forests can persist and reproduce. At the same time, because we have this, this reproductive competition, this evolutionary competition between the parts, 
it seems like it is not a Darwinian individual. And so we are stuck with a contradiction and contradictions are not tenable in philosophy. So I don't have an answer to that no. question. <laughs> well, of course, there has to be new pastures to discover, of course, and new, always new questions and, you know, things that lead to new questions in philosophy, especially, I think. And do you feel like when I studied biology, um, we were taught theory of evolution, you know, basically by Darwin and, and it was all framed as a struggle for survival and survival of the fittest. And uh, we did have some things on group selection and things like that but what i don't remember that they taught us was the you know the whole cooperative and um, the, the big part of symbiosis and of organisms cross species to sort of wire to work together is that something that is more and more coming into our understanding of how you know our ecosystems work that it's not just about struggle and competition which is of course a part of it but also about you know networking and living you know very intimately together even inside of each other's cells yes the old darwinian school of thought was that we have struggle for existence and then that's what separates us in individuals individuals struggle against one another for existence some of them reproduce some of them fail That's the old story. Starting in the early 1990s, a biologist, especially microbiologists, were looking at how certain uh, microbes stick together. They stick together and they reproduce together. And so, like I said, in the early 1990s, biologists came up with this idea of the hollow biont. A hollow biont is going to be an individual composed of multiple evolutionary lineages. The genes are working together to make a single, a single thing, which is collectively struggling for existence. So what does this mean? It means that Darwin only had half of the, the, the story right. Yes, competition, that's a big part of it. But we also have cooperation. That's an equally big part of it. Yeah, that's so interesting. So actually, we, you know, life on Earth is created and sustained not just by struggle, but also by, you know, these intimate corporations and symbiosis and that are also actually part of us already inside our cells and, you know, and, and you know, the microbes living on us as, as well. So then what I found interesting is that you talked a lot about, you know, evolution, Darwin, uh, gen identity, Darwinian individuals. And you told me um, that you actually started out studying philosophy at a Catholic seminary, thinking about really big, almost unanswerable questions like, Who is God? What is a person? Why are we here? And I'm wondering if studying mushrooms and studying all these life cycles and uh, what it means you know, to be an individual, if that brought you any closer to the questions you first started out with when you started studying philosophy. Okay, did it bring me closer to those big questions? So first of all, I studied... I started my philosophical career in a Catholic seminary. I didn't go to school right after high school. I joined the Navy and I, I was I was almost 30 years old before I took my first philosophy class. And the more I studied philosophy, the more I began to realize that the story which the Catholics were telling about, about creation, about redemption, all that, that story just did not seem to match what I was getting from the biology. And so that led me away from looking at these big questions and looking at more concrete biological questions. At the same time, I was having this something of a reverse epiphany, I suppose, that like, oh, maybe this this whole story, which I'm trying to participate in, is just not true. I experienced a spiritual experience from eating mushrooms, from eating hallucinogenic mushrooms. And that was the thing which shifted me away from these complex questions about God to these more concrete biological questions. If there is a God, if we are all connected together in some way, then it's way more complex than the the story centered around humans. The Bible tells us. The Bible tells us that God created us and then the, the world is here for us. And yeah. it's, it's just not. It's not. We, we, we are, are one species in this big, complex, evolving thing. And we are not the dominators of nature. We're not here to rule nature. We are just one more part. And I, I think that if we realize that, if we have this, this humbling, that this, this humility, that no, God did not create the world for us. We are just one little branch of this evolutionary lineage. No, I love that because I think that's part of maybe my own search in this topic is understanding who we are as humans on this planet and the narrative we've been fed yeah, throughout through Christianity, but also uh, in modern capitalism is that we are as the center of the universe for better or worse we still are we are the ones um, you know destroying the planet or, or saving the planet but I think the more humble position would be that you know whatever we do earth will survive if we don't sort of find our place in the whole and and accept our place in that bigger part then you know the human species probably won't be around for long you know our technology can get us far but not that far so I really love how you framed it and also triggers for me something that 
well, we may not be, you know, the top of the world, but we are also not alone because we are in some way connected to all these different organisms and species, you know, within our own physical bodies. Yeah, thank you so much for that insight. And actually, thank you so much for the whole conversation. I, with that, I think we can conclude our meeting. It was so interesting, Dan. I really learned so much. And I think that by exploring individuality, identity, gen identity, and, you know, pondered what it means to live in a network world, I think it was so inspiring. Thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure talking with you today. For more information about the project Creating Life by Marjolein Pineapples, links and show notes, visit futurebased.org.